Hello, and welcome back to the Mechanochemistry Discussions hosted by the NSF Center for Mechanical Control of Chemistry, or the CMCC. I'm Ashley Martini. The goal of the seminar series is to bring the community together. Our seminars stream live on the third Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. Central. They are streamed and then hosted for watching anytime on YouTube. We have had a great group of speakers already as part of the seminar spirit series. If you missed any of them, I encourage you to check them out. We also already have planned another great group of speakers through the end of 2021 and also into 2022. I encourage you to join us for all of them. Before we get started, a few quick thank yous. Thanks to Dr. James Batiste, the director of the CMCC, Jennifer Belsick, the center's administrative coordinator, and Noah Sheehan and Quintarius Moore, CMCC students who are coordinating the seminar series. Thank you so much for joining us. Please do follow us and subscribe to our YouTube channel, CMCC Mechanochemistry Discussions. A few quick notes, reminder that the seminar is being recorded. If you have any questions for the speaker, you can email them to us at cmccdiscussions at gmail.com and we'll propagate them to the speaker, or you can post them on YouTube directly. Either way, note that we do reserve the right to remove comments from YouTube. Finally, the most important thing, join me in welcoming today's seminar speaker, Dr. Deb Crawford. Dr. Crawford obtained her, her master's and PhD in chemistry at Queen's University, Belfast. She spent one year seconded into Moth Technologies Limited and was then appointed as a postdoctoral researcher to investigate synthesis by twin screw extrusion, of which she now has several years of experience. Currently, Dr. Crawford is a bioorganic lecturer in the School of Chemistry and Biosciences at the University of Bradford. Dr. Crawford's group's main research activity involves determining the bioactivity of mechanochemically prepared metallodrugs and investigating new technologies for solvent-free synthesis, including sonochemistry. Join me in welcoming Dr. Crawford as she presents on developments in large-scale mechanochemical synthesis. Hello, um, thank you to the NSF Centre and to Dr Martini for inviting me to give this seminar. Um, so as my title suggests, I'm going to be talking today about the recent developments in the scale up of mechanochemical synthesis. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical manufacture. So before I start talking about what we've been doing in terms of scale up, I'd like to take this opportunity to have just a very brief discussion about some of the work that we're still doing in terms of ball milling. Um, so the project that I'm going to discuss now is a project that came about whenever I was thinking about how mechanochemistry could be adapted into pharmaceutical manufacture. So a lot of the mechanochemistry community at the moment is looking into the synthesis of API, so active pharmaceutical ingredients using ball milling, twin screw extrusion and other mechanochemical techniques. And they've been showing really successfully how they've been able to prepare these APIs successfully, how they're meeting the standards of conventional, conventionally prepared APIs as well. However, one of the areas that I found that there was a bit of a niche was actually showing the bioactivity of the API. So how the API might react towards cells, for example, if we're looking at cytotoxic studies, how they may react towards bacteria and things like that. And I think that is something that we really need to look at before the pharmaceutical industry really takes mechanochemical synthesis of API seriously. For the moment, we've just done this on a ball milling scale, and we decided to look at cytotoxic materials because as amateur biologists um, who went to collaborators, um, we thought, okay, this is the easiest method and kind of one of the most popular methods um, in terms of uh, bioactive materials. So what we did, we looked at, through the literature and we were trying to find possible cytotoxic materials that are currently being investigated but haven't yet went to clinical trials. The reason why we were selecting these ones is because usually whenever the compound has went to clinical trials, the manufacturing process has already been designed and developed. However, if we selected something that was kind of in the running um, for uh, clinical trials and therefore eventually going to the patients, then the manufacturing process may not have been decided upon and therefore not established. 
And there would have been then the possible, or what we believe there might be the possibility for pharmaceutical companies to maybe then start considering a mechanochemical approach. So we find this compound here, which I'll discuss in a wee bit more detail, which is copper meloxicam. So it's basically made of meloxicam, which is an API in itself. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. It's used to treat inflammation in cats and dogs. It's reacted with copper acetate in the presence of ethanol and DMF. And the synthesis was this was already reported by Cindy et al. And they discussed as well the cytotoxic properties, especially towards ovarian cancer cells. So we decided to try this in the ball mill. So basically taking our reagents and adding one equivalent of ethanol and one equivalent of um, DMF. And we were getting products that we thought were what we were desired. We were getting these nice green products coming out of the ball mill. So we carried out powder x-ray diffraction in order to determine whether or not we were getting the same product as that prepared conventionally and that prepared by Cine et al. And what we found was actually the powder XRDs didn't match up very well. There were some similarities that we could see, but there was no clear overlap of it, saying then that we weren't actually getting the product we were expecting. So we were wondering what was happening. We did a lot of investigation into this, and I'll not go into all of the detail of the investigation today, but we were looking at things like the elemental analysis, so the composition of the elements in the compound. We were looking at things like TGA to see what um, see what solvents were coming off. And we were also looking a wee bit more closely at powder XRD patterns of various um, trichnobipyramidal complexes and octahedral complexes. And basically the conclusion that we came to, unfortunately we weren't get, able to get a single X-ray diffraction pattern or sorry, a single crystal of the copper meloxicam that we obtained by ball milling to confirm the structure. But what we hypothesized was that actually we were getting this octahedral geometry complex instead. And we were able to show via TGA and elemental analysis that actually it seemed to have two molecules of DMF coordinated to the copper center. So this was in, um, as an alternative to the trichinol bipyramidal compound that was prepared conventionally. Now, what we tried to do was we tried to form the octahedral complex in solution. So we tried to carry out uh, conventional synthesis. And we find as well there we can never actually form the octahedral compound. So where we started off this project, actually looking at the, cyto looking at the cytotoxicity of compounds and comparing the ball milling to the conventional synthesis, we actually stumbled across a nice little um, project in its own looking at how actually the ball mill synthesis uh, results in a product that cannot be obtained via conventional synthesis. And that was kind of the take home message of the publication that we have on this. But we decided to go on ahead and look at the cytotoxicity studies of the materials anyway. And we tried them against the uh, school of three ovarian cancer cells. And this was carried out by Professor Al Jamal at Queen's University Belfast in the School of Pharmacy. And also collaborating on this um, was Aaron McCalmond and Dr. Christina Lagunas of the School of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at Queen's Belfast as well. So the pharmacy department carried out a range of cytotoxicity studies over 24, 48 and 92 hours doing cell viability assays. And they looked at a range of different components. So they looked at the control systems and they seen that actually this is just to prove that the cells were behaving as expected. They looked at DMSO. The reason why we chose DMSO, it's a common solvent in which you dissolve cytotoxic agents into before you treat cancer cells with it um, whenever you're doing in vitro analysis. We looked at this um, at the free ligand as well, so meloxicam, which is shown in light blue here. In dark blue is the conventionally prepared copper meloxicam, so that's the trichinol bipyramidal complex. And then in orange, we have that what we believe is the octahedral complex. We can ignore in this presentation the pink and the green because they were alternating solvents between DMF with DMSO and water, but um, I'm not going to discuss those today. So we looked at a range of concentrations. We looked at 10 micromolar, 50 micromolar and 100 micromolar. And what we found was that at 10 micromolar, we didn't really see any cell death occurring, so there was no real decrease in the cell viability. Whenever we increased concentration to 50 micromolar, 
what we found was that the conventionally prepared tri, tri bipyramidal copper complex didn't show any decrease in cell viability, so there didn't appear to be any cell death. However, the mechanochemically prepared compound, which we can see here in orange, we do see a slight decrease to around 75 to 80% cell viability showing some death of the cancer cells. But more importantly, whenever we increase the 100 micromolar, what we see is there's a dramatic decrease in the cell viability. Um, if we look at the orange bar again, so that is the ball mill product we can see that the cell viability is around 50% and it's much lower than the cell viability obtained for the conventionally prepared compound. So he, the overall take home message from this was that actually in this case, the bomb that lines to the mechanochemical synthesis allowed us to obtain an alternative product that we can't obtain conventionally. And with that, we actually were able to enhance the cytotoxicity of that compound as well. Are we able to improve the cytotoxicity of copper meloxicam? So this work is um, ongoing and we're actually looking at a range of different copper complexes and hopefully as well, we hope to scale the synthesis of these up and to look at the cytotoxicity of them as well. So with that, I'll now start on to the, what the bulk of this presentation is going to be about. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the scale up of mechanochemical processing. So initially in around 2014, Professor Stuart James of Queen's University Belfast and Professor Tony McNally, currently of Warwick University in the UK, um, were discussing how they would scale up ball milling um, because Stuart at that point was looking at a range of different metal organic framework synthesis by ball milling, different metal complexes. But the main thing at that point was how were they going to scale it up? And they were looking at rain different types of ball mills in which they could do this, but they were worried about aspects such as compaction on the sides of the vessels and a few other drawbacks as well. Now, Tony is a polymer chemist and has a lot of expertise with this piece of equipment here, which is called a twin screw extruder. So the twin screw extruder is already a well-known piece of equipment that is used in uh, formulation of pharmaceutical materials. It's used in polymer processing. And it's also heavily used in the food industry as well. So their initial idea was to take the extruder and to actually use this for solid state synthesis or solvent free synthesis. And years have gone by where we've been carrying out a range of different experiments, which I'll discuss today, using this extruder on carrying out chemical synthesis. So just to show you what exactly happens in the extruder, I'm going to show the synthesis of a perylene dye, Black 31, which is a commercial dye. So if I can get this video to work. There we are. So this is an extruder that fits into a standard fume hood. So it's a lab based extruder. Um, it consists of the motor here and the feeder, which is feeding in our anhydride, which is bright red. And you can see the material being dropped into the extruder barrel. Okay, in this case we have, it's not a solvent that we're adding in through this second port, it's actually an amine, so it's a second reagent and it's reacting with the anhydride to form this pyrrolene dye that we have here. So the materials, the starting reagents are being fed into the extruder and they're being passed along this barrel which is heatable and you can see that it's segmented as well so we can control the temperature along the extruder barrel. And what is coming out is this black product. And that black product is actually our pyrrolene dye. So that is black 31. And at the minute, we're able to prepare about half a kilogram of this per hour. And again, I must uh, reiterate, this is a lab scale extruder. So if we were to scale this up into larger extruders, we could push that production rate up dramatically. So just to show you what exactly is happening within the extruder, I have that basically shows the screws as they move whenever your material is in. So we have this conveying section and then we have these kneading sections, which I'll explain in a second. And it's in those kneading sections where a lot of the mechanical energy is actually given to the material and we find a lot of the reaction um, takes place. And you can see that whenever you take the barrels apart, that's where you get the most kind of compaction of your solid reagents and product together. 
So just for those who haven't used extrusion or haven't um, heard of extrusion before, um, the different parameters that we can investigate typically include screw speed. We can change the screw speed anything from zero up to about 300 RPM on the extruder that we had, um, that we used for the work I'm going to talk about today. We can vary the temperature, so the temperature can also be raised to about 350 degrees on this extruder. We can change the feed rate, which then affects things like the compression forces that are present within the extruder, extruder barrel. And then finally, we can also change the screw configuration as well. Now, these are only some of the parameters. There are others that we can investigate, but these are the common ones that we use for our investigations. So as I said, we can alter the screw configuration that we employ, and this can actually be very important in the reactions that we're carrying out. So for example, if we have reactions that have dramatic changes in the rheology, we want screw configuration profiles that can really handle that change in configuration. So if we get quite a sticky material passing along, it can still work that material and get it to move. So basically we would have, we commonly have two different screw configuration profiles. This top one here is what we call our standard screw configuration. So initially we have a conveying section present and that is to help the star fed uh, extruder pull the starting reagents into the extruder and the conveying sections, the conveying pitches on this section are actually quite wide to allow the, um, a very kind of efficient packing of the extruder and pull of the reagents in. And then you can see here, and I have a purple box around it, we have these kneading elements. So it's these kneading elements where we find a lot of the work takes place. And we position the elements or the segments at 30, 60 and 90 degrees to each other, with the 90 degrees elements um, resulting in the most rub against each other and therefore we um, can assume the most mechanical energy. So we don't just have one kneading section present in the screw profile, because if we had too much, then the overall um, forces in the extruder would build up and be too high. Um, so what we do is we break the kneading section into small parts. So we have our conveying, then a kneading, and then we have conveying to help push the material forward along because we need it to exit the extruder. And then it meets another conveying section and this repeats until we get towards the end. The other alternative screw configuration that we tend to use is what we call our reverse screw configuration. So again, we have our conveying section at the beginning, which is the same as the standard. We have our kneading section. And in this case, we have a couple more 90 degree elements in here because we want to have a really hostile um, environment to really apply the most mechanical energy that we can. And then we have strategically placed these reverse elements or these reverse segments straight after the kneading section. And what these reverse segments do is it actually retards the flow of the material along the extruder. So it doesn't push it back, but it actually just holds it in place for a little bit longer. And therefore the material is exposed to this kneading section for a prolonged period of time. And we have the same thing again as we go to the second kneading section on this one. And then the material is conveyed along before it exits the extruder. Now I should comment that typically for these reactions in the standard screw profile, our residence time, so that's the time from the beginning of, um, from the starting materials entering at the beginning of the screw profile and exiting at the end, the time is usually takes about two minutes at most. Whenever we use the reverse screw configuration, we can actually modify the residence time and actually we can prolong the time for up to 40 minutes or one hour in some cases. We can also even have it as short as about 10 to 12 minutes. Now, obviously with these um, reactions, it's not as simple as your percentage yield whenever you're analyzing the products at the end and analyzing the efficiency of your reaction. So what we employ is this engineering term and there are several um, different parameters that could be used to analyze the efficiency, but we use space time yield. So that is simply the amount of product per day divided by the reactor volume. And as you'll see through one of the examples I discussed later, our space time yields are very, very high. And the reason for that is because the reactor volume is very low. We don't have any solvent in the system and we're taking the free volume around those screws in a tight packed barrel. 
and that gives us these very high space time yields. So in addition, whenever it comes to carrying out chemical synthesis, not only do we carry out just one step, organic or inorganic coordination chemistry, where our synthesis are usually multi-step and especially if we're relaying it to things like the pharmaceutical industry. So with that, then we tried to find a way in which we could couple reactions together in the one extrusion process. So how we did this was through the telescoping of reactions. So within the extruder that we were using for this work, we were actually so far only able to couple two um, reaction processes into one extruder. But if you were to take a larger extruder, you could definitely increase the number of reactions that you could do. So simply what we did was in feeder A, we would add in reagents A and B. And basically reaction one would take place in segments one, two, and three. And remember as well that each of these segments can be heated individually. So we can have segment one at 60 degrees, segment two at 80, segment three at 100, et cetera. So once we get to segment four, we would then expect to have product one already formed. At this point, we could add in through feeder B reagency. And what that does is that reacts then with product one and we get our second chemical reaction taking place and we end up forming product two. So in this case, we were able to telescope two chemical reactions together. And we've been able to demonstrate that for both organic and coordination chemistry. So the other thing that we've been doing with the extruder, before I start talking about the different examples that we can be doing, is actually understanding the extrusion process and translating these batch processes to continuous processing. Um, and especially with chemical synthesis, because this is the first time that we've been doing chemical synthesis in this manner, we wanted to try and understand what is happening in the processes. So again, with the help of Tony McNally um, at the University of Warwick, he suggested that we use this Hake rail mix provided by Thermo Fisher. So basically what we have here is a batch mixer and in the middle of this batch mixer, we have two rotors. And those rotors simply mimic one kneading section of the twin screw extruder, or that's what we were trying to use it as. And what we do is you feed in your materials through this funnel, and you feed in your starting materials, and you turn the rotors on, and you can heat the reactions as well. And you monitor the change in torque, so that's the change in the twisting force over time as those rotors are moving. And depending on the chemical reaction, you can actually get quite a lot of information from it. So we were actually looking at the synthesis of OLED. So we were reacting 8-hydroxyquinoline with a range of metal salts. And in particular, we were looking at the reaction of 8-hydroxyquinoline with aluminium acetate. And if we just initially look at these, these figures that I have at the top, this is the material, so this is the 8-hydroxyquinoline and the aluminium salt as it's just entered into the center of this batch mixer. And you can hopefully see the silver rotors in the middle or the stainless steel rotors. And you can see that actually on the surface, there is a slight color change. So the starting materials were bright white and you can start to see there's a little bit of yellow forming. So that indicated to us that the, a reaction was starting to take place. However, whenever we analyzed the material, there was no reaction that could be seen. It was all starting materials. So it was a very, very small amount of product just forming on the surface. Now, as the material was left to mix for another minute or two, we can see the intensity of that yellow color deepen and you can see it becomes more prominent. But again, if we carried out the powder x-ray diffraction right away, so we would take a sample and we would go straight to the XRD room, which was next door, run the analysis, all we would see would be starting materials being formed. But if we left the reaction to turn, the rotors to turn for another couple of minutes or another couple of seconds, what we were seeing was this dramatic change in the rheology. And instead of having these fine powders, what we were finding was this sticky yellow material forming that was sticking to the sides of the vessel and sticking to the sides of the rotor. Now, at the same time, what we were looking at was some mathematical data from the instrument. So we were producing these radiograms that I have down here. So basically a radiogram shows the change in torque over time. 
so change in torque against time. And we were looking at things such as the twisting force, so the torque, we were looking also at things like temperature and stuff. But today I'm just going to talk about the difference in torque. We looked at a range of different parameters that we would normally have in our twin screw extrusion process. So normally we would look at things like particle size, screw speed. Uh, we couldn't look at temperature as effectively because the system wasn't as tight as we needed to be and we ended up getting some leakage of the starting materials. But we did get enough information that was interesting on the particle size and screw speed. So if we look over here to the left hand side, what we are looking at here is rheograms for the particle of change in particle size of 8-hydroxyquinoline. So 8-hydroxyquinoline, whenever you purchase it, comes as large flakes. So initially we put these large flakes into the, um, into the rheometer, into the batch mixer. And what we found was that actually, if we're looking at the torque profile, which is this one here in red, we've seen that the torque dramatically increased up to 15 Newton meters within one minute. The torque then almost plateaus, it decreased a bit and then plateaus up until over three minutes, and it decreased again and then plateaus. And what we were able to find by analyzing the material at different time frames was that actually once this torque had reached its maximum of 15 Newton meters, we actually had the reaction being instigated. So what we were able to say was that whenever we used flake material, we were able to have a short residence time in the extruder barrel of about one minute. However, whenever we were using sieved material or ground and sieved material, we basically took the 8-hydroxyquinoline broke it down to 500 micron and we put that into the batch mixer. We've seen that over time the torque actually remained really low and we didn't see this change in rheology occurring. But once we got to about three and a half minutes we've seen a sharp intake or uptake of the torque and we see that it jumps up to 300 newton meters and then it decreases again now we see this second increase and we were able to relate that because we could watch what was happening at the front of this batch mixer because we had a perspex cover on. We were able to see the, um, the thick material, the fiscus material move from the left hand side over to the right hand side of the batch mixer and then that increased that torque a little bit again. But you can see that you have a much cleaner profile once the material has uh, gotten over that increase in torque and it room plateaus at a very low torque. So what that told us was that actually in the extruder, if we used a smaller particle size, we were gonna to have to increase our residence time quite a lot from one minute to four minutes, but we would have overall a smoother process, which actually would be better if we were running this as a continuous long-term manufacturing method. So on the other hand as well, what we were looking at was the screw speed and the effect of screw speed on the um, torque and the initiation of the reaction. So if we look at this graph on the right hand side, what we have is the rheograms at 30 RPM, which is shown in navy, at 55 RPM shown in red, and then 75 in green. And what we've seen, obviously, whenever you're going at a slower uh, screw speed or rotor speed, you expect then that less mechanical energy is being implied, applied to the reaction and therefore it's creating more torque is needed and it requires a larger twisting force in order to get the reaction to be initiated. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing that it's taking a longer time. It's taking over three minutes for that reaction to be initiated and reach a maximum torque of almost 70 newton meters. However, whenever we increase, increase the screw speed, to 55 RPM, we can see that the time is dramatically decreased. We're looking at 50 Newton meters and that the torque, sorry, the time is decreased to two minutes and the torque is decreased to 50 Newton meters. And then at 75 RPM, the time remains the same in this case, but the torque again dramatically decreases. And that means that it's a more smoother profile requiring less energy over a long period of time in order to get the reaction to be initiated within two minutes and for it to run continuously. So with that then, once we started to understand the extrusion process, with a range of different collaborators across the UK and Europe, we decided to look at what we could actually prepare via twin screw extrusion. 
And what we were able to show was that actually we could prepare a range of organic compounds, especially via condensation reactions. We were able to make these coordination materials based on this, these CIF base um, ligands. We were able to make commercial perylene dyes. And we were also, which we did initially at the very, very beginning, was to be able to make metal organic frameworks using twin screw extrusion. And then we were also able to carry out fluorination reactions and things that were carried out with our collaborators in, um, in Cardiff. And a lot of this work wouldn't have been possible without the collaborators coming and collaborating with us, bringing their knowledge of their chemistry and we had our knowledge of the extrusion process. And I think that we've built up quite a large library of examples at this point. What was a wee bit more adventurous after a while was that we then collaborated with um, Becky Greenaway um, at the University of Liverpool and Andy Cooper. Um, both of our supervisors at the time, Stuart James and Andy Cooper, um, are well known for their work in porous liquids and porous materials. And one of the things that they have been looking at are these amine-based cages. So they've been synthesizing for many years now these CC3 amine cages and making them into porous liquids. And what we decided that we wanted to do to kind of merge the mechanochemistry and the porous material um, research areas together a bit more was actually to see whether or not we can make these amine cages by extrusion. So Becky Greenaway and several others from the University of Liverpool came to Belfast and with um, a lot of optimization on the extrusion process and about two weeks of work. Uh, we've been able to successfully prepare these CC3 4 plus 6 amine cages. And as you can see here by the uh, HPLC analysis as well, the as extruded product down here in purple, um, we can see that there is a large peak that matches up with the pure CC3 that we see up here in green. Um, we can also show the comparison whenever the CC3 cage is made via continuous flow in hexane, water, ethyl acetate and ethanol as well. What was also quite interesting was that actually via the extrusion process, we've been able to prepare this 3 plus 5 oligomer that was also, and that's also known to form as an intermediate in the reaction. And actually the researchers at the University of Liverpool were actually for once able to isolate the 3.5 intermediate, whereas previously they hadn't been able to do before. So that was another major advantage of using the twin screw extrusion process for the synthesis of these CC3 cages. Now, we also carried out uh, the BET analysis of this. And unfortunately, what we found initially was that actually the extrusive material was not porous um, unless it was activated uh, via solvent exchange. And especially whenever you compare it to the different solvents that the CC3 cage was prepared via continuous flow in. For example, in ethanol, we can see the amount of absorbed gas is dramatically higher than that of the as extruded or the hexane um, synthesis. But if we just did the solvent exchange and did recrystallization for a couple of days, we were actually able to find that we got a highly porous material that matched that of the ethanol synthesis as well. So even though the extrusion process was really efficient, we did have to add on this extra step. So as a result, then we analyzed the parameters that were employed in, uh, comparing continuous flow with batch synthesis and with twin screw extrusion for the synthesis of the CC3 cages. So for example, if we look here at the red graph, so the one on the left, we can see that for the volume, for the batch synthesis, the reaction does require about 200 mils to make five grams of the CC3 cage. And we can see that the purification requires another um, about 50 to 100 mils of solvent as well. If we look at the continuous flow, which is one of the main contenders, um, competitors of twin screw extrusion, because it's another continuous efficient process, you can see that the total amount of solvent that it requires is dramatically more than the batch process and dramatically more than twin screw extrusion over here on the right hand side. So you can see that for the reaction, we're needing about 600 mils of solvent. And then for the purification, we're needing up to 3,000 mils of solvent. 
Whereas for the twin screw extrusion, we don't need any solvent for the synthesis, but we just need some for that purification in order to instigate the porosity of the material. So overall, in terms of the solvent usage, twin screw extrusion is winning in terms in comparison with continuous flow and with batch synthesis. Now, if we look at the time required to carry out the synthesis, um, unsurprisingly, batch synthesis requires nearly 125 hours in order to make the five grams of CC3. Flow synthesis is requiring just under 20 hours. And twin screw extrusion, it does initially look like it requires more time than flow, but actually if we look at the experimental bit, so the actual reaction, you can see here that it is minimal. So that's showing that actually we only need minutes for five grams of CC3 to form. And it, again, it's this, this issue with instigating the porosity that is increasing that time because we needed to leave the material sitting in solvent for a couple of days, or for one day, I should say. So overall, I would say that even though flow is slightly lower um, in terms of time requirements than TSC, I still think that it's an excellent contender com in comparison to continuous flow. And especially whenever we compare it with the amount of solvent that it requires. And also it's a, the first example of preparing an organic cage via twin screw extrusion. And it can lead to a large range of um, projects stemming from this. Now on to the work that we've been looking at to try and establish um, mechanochemistry for use in the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm going to talk about one example in particular today. And that is the synthesis of nitrofurantoin. And this work became possible whenever Evelina Colicino uh, came to Stuart James and I and instigated this project in order to prepare nitrofurantoin, which is a hydrosone API antibiotic. Um, that she has a lot of experience in and proposed that we prepare it via twin screw extrusion. And the project was only possible through the, um, the cost action that Evelina is also the action chair of. And it also helps us to meet the aims and the, the aims and objectives of the cost initiative as well, which is to prepare APIs via twin screw extrusion or on a large sustainable methods. So in the work that we carried out, and actually it was highlighted as an ACS editor's choice and then highlighted again in CNN News as well, we looked at the synthesis of nitrofurantoin and dontrolene. Both of these compounds, um, Evelina had a lot of experience in. So nitrofurantoin, I already said, has an antibiotic to treat urinary tract infections. Dontrolene is a muscle relaxant to treat malignant hypothermia. Now, both materials can be prepared starting from these semi carbicides. So, for the nitrofurantoin, we started with the semi carbicide and reacted, reacted it with an aldehyde uh, in the extruder. And what we found was that actually, in order to form the E isomer, because we could have E or Z isomers being formed, in order to form the E isomer, which was desired, we actually needed very mild conditions. So the temperature could just be left at room temperature. We did not need to apply any heat. And the screw speed was kept at 55 RPM, which is a standard screw speed that we use. And the materials would be formed in a couple of minutes. And what we find, and I'll discuss this a wee bit more later, is that our space time yield was very high at 6.8 by 10 to the three kilograms per meters cubed per day. Now, to analyze that we were definitely forming um, the desired nitrofurantoin, when we carried out solid state carbon NMR spectroscopy, and this was carried out in the University of Calgary in Italy um, by Andrea Porchetto. So we looked at the NMR, we looked at the NMR of the starting material. So we have our semi carbicide, and we can see our uh, resonance for the CH2 group at 55.9 ppm. Then we have our aldehyde where we can see our aldehyde peak at 175. And then whenever we looked at the nitrofurantoin prepared by extrusion, we can see that actually the aldehyde peak is, is not, no longer visible, it's no longer present. We can see the formation of the peak for this amine bond. And also we can see that there's an upfield shift for the CH2 group from 55 to 49 ppm, showing again that the nitrofurantoin was prepared 
successfully, we also carried out a range of other analytical techniques to prove this as well. We were also able to confirm as well that we were able to get the E isomer selectively at room temperature. Whenever uh, we were carrying out the initial optimization of these reactions, we were actually looking at the effect of heat. So we were increasing the temperatures on the extruder barrel up to about 150 degrees. So we carried out experiments at room temperature, 40 degrees, 60 degrees, 80, 100 degrees, et cetera. And actually what we found quite interestingly was as we increased the temperature um, of the extruder barrel, we were actually getting mixtures of the E to Z isomer. Now we did try and push the reaction to get 100% Z isomer, but unfortunately we weren't able to get the correct um, uh, parameters in order to obtain that. We always got the mixture. But it was really neat and very nice to see that actually at room temperature, we were selectively getting the E isomer of the nitroformatoin. And we were also concerned that actually this seemed really easy. Room temperature, 55 RPM, a couple of minutes, we were able to get the nitrofrantoin that we want. And so Evelina um, back in Montpellier, we carried out an aging study using IR spectroscopy just to confirm that actually the nitrofrantoin wasn't forming immediately upon um, introduction of the two starting reagents with each other. And actually we found that it took a long time before actually we started to see any product being formed. So the reaction wasn't proceeding during the aging steps. So the main conclusion from this was that actually this was the first time that twin screw extrusion had been used for the synthesis of an antibiotic and for the synthesis of any active pharmaceutical ingredient. And as well as that, we put together this diagram here to kind of um, weigh up the advantages of solution-based synthesis to twin screw extrusion. And as you can see, that the advantages of twin screw extrusion completely outweigh solution-based synthesis. And looking at the STY, um, so that's the space-time yield, you can see that for, for the solution-based synthesis, we were preparing, we were getting yields of 430 kilograms per meters cubed per day. And that is based on industrial data that we were able to get hold of. Whereas with the extrusion process, and again, this is using a lab-based size extruder, we were actually getting space time yields of 68,000 kilograms per meters cubed per day. And so we believe that this really shows how efficient the extrusion process is for preparing these active pharmaceutical ingredients. So in terms of the future of extrusion, I think extrusion has a really bright future ahead of it. It's not just the groups at the University at Queen's University of Belfast and now myself at the University of Bradford who are looking into synthesis by extrusion. We have groups in Croatia and in France looking into the process. And I think this is something that is going to replicate throughout the mechanochemistry community. In addition to that, through the cost action, we're, um, we've also been looking at different technologies that can be used to carry out large scale synthesis. And there's a lot of potential there as well. So I think mechanochemistry and large scale mechanochemistry has a really bright future ahead of it, especially as it's being pioneered and it's being supported by the Cost Association Network. And now more recently, the EU Green Deal, which hopefully um, a successful application will be made to. So just before I finish, um, I just kind of want to highlight a little area that will take a couple of minutes of research that I've been looking into that sometimes I forget to discuss whenever I'm giving presentations. And that is sonochemical organic synthesis. So basically this is actually carrying out solvent-free synthesis. Um, and the reason why I embarked in this project was I was thinking as an early career researcher, how could I carry out solvent-free synthesis in my lab without having to buy an expensive piece of equipment such as a ball mill or an extruder? And so I wanted to see whether or not we could actually carry out solvent-free synthesis using just a standard ultrasonic bath that most um, laboratories have or people can get access to. And I wanted to see whether or not actually we could um, overcome the need for solvent and the need for acoustic cavitation as the mechanism by which sonochemical synthesis occurs and see whether or not we could get two solid reagents to mix together. 
And I actually extended this on as well in the last couple of years to looking at pharmaceutical cool crystals. But today I'm just going to show you a little bit of the organic synthesis. So what I was doing was I was carrying out this organic reaction and I have had Cloda Miskimmon as well working on this with me, who was an undergrad project student, where we took um, orthophenylene and 1,2-phenylenediamine. And basically, as you can see in the diagram here, we put them together in a sample vial and we put them in the sonicator. And literally we just turned the sonicator on and left it to react for 60 minutes. Now, initially the reaction went really easily um, because the water bath was also heating up. But then we set up a system where we would actually keep the water bath cool um, in order to prevent temperature causing the reaction to proceed. And initially what we found whenever we were doing it cool was that actually the particle size played a massive effect on how well the reactions went. And that seems quite sensible. So if we have the two starting materials, the amine and the aldehyde together here, you can see they're quite large particles. And therefore, whenever they started to react in the sonicator, what we found was actually we were getting large clumps of the product. And within that, those large clumps, you were actually finding your starting materials being trapped there. And so what we did was then we actually ground the material and sifted until it was less than 200 micron. And then we put it in the sonicator and sonicated it for one hour. And we were able to get a complete reaction um, taking place at this point. And again, yes, it's the particle size and the reaction could be happening on the surface. But what we were able to show was actually the reaction was extending beyond just the surface and actually all of the product or all of the material we obtained was product. And so I think, and I know other groups have been looking at solvent-free acoustic uh, synthesis as well, but I do think that there's actually quite a lot of potential in this and it's still a niche area as well. And we have also looked at, as I said, cool crystal formation, other organic re um, reactions there. So I think um, this will actually be a neat area and hopefully we see some more um, publications coming from this. So just to finish up, um, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank a couple of people. Uh, so I would like to thank Aaron McCalment, uh, who was the master student involved in the copper meloxicam work. And he really drove the experiment or drove the project on and worked really hard on it. And that project took place at Queen's University Belfast. Um, I would like to thank Becky Greenaway for all of the work and support with the porous cages materials. And finally, Evelina Colacino, um, as well for the work on the nitrofrantoin. And also, I would also like to really thank Professor Stuart James, who was my supervisor through a lot of the work that I've presented here today and the PI on a lot of this work as well. And there are several institutions that I'll not sit and list them all and um, that I would like to thank for their support and coming and collaborating with us over the last couple of years. And finally, I'd like to thank you for listening. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. We have a few questions. Thank you. All right, so we have actually a, a couple questions on the kneading versus conveying components in the extrusion process. So uh, let's pick one here. Can you clarify the use of kneading and conveying? And for example, how do you decide which combination works best? Uh, okay, so with the conveying sections, they don't really instigate the chemical reaction taking place unless it's a very, very fast reaction. Um, they're mainly there to aid the flow of the material from the beginning of the extruder to the end of the extruder. So the kneading sections, that is where you're applying a lot of shear material and you're actually getting a lot of the rubbing um, of the reagents together. So if you think about two egg-shaped kneading elements, and they're positioned at like say 90 degrees to each other. Um, so what you find is actually your reagents are getting trapped within maybe a 1.8 millimeter space. So you're applying a lot of um, shear and a lot of rubbing forces there. And it's that bit that's actually instigating the chemical reaction. Whereas the uh, conveying is just helping the movement of the material along the extruder barrel. Makes sense. On a related note, um, I noticed that there were many parameters, including the size and distribution of the kneading and conveying, as well as the torque and speed. How do you optimize these? And for example, is there an opportunity for machine learning here? 
Uh, I think there's definitely an opportunity for machine learning and there probably is within the polymer industry, but as us being quite novel and pretending to be engineers, and chemists, um, we, we're kind of just finding our way. In terms, and I think actually this relates to the last question, which I didn't answer properly, I apologize. Um, in terms of deciding on the screw configurations and how we build the profiles, um, it actually just comes for us, it just comes with intuition. Uh, so initially, whenever we went to 3Tech is the company um, off the extruder that we purchased. Uh, initially, whenever we went to them, they give us some, um, they give us some advice on having maybe 30 and 60 degree uh, angled segments. And we trialed out some experiments So the synthesis of metal organic frameworks. We trialed out on those um, screw profiles. But just with intuition, as we start to learn about the reactions themselves, how the material behaves, their physical changes, their rheology, um, that kind of tells us how we could optimize and modify. So, for example, if we have a very uh, viscous material going through, what we might find is that having segments positioned at 90 degrees, which is more hostile, might actually be too hostile for the reaction. And we might not be able to get the material to flow through the material through the extruder because the extruder would just torque out because the twisting force would build up to unsafe levels. So then we would know to keep it at 30 and 60 degrees. Um, if we had reactions that weren't proceeding even with temperature, and we thought that maybe they were just coming through the barrel a little bit too fast. That's whenever we know to put in those reverse segments. And we just decided to put the reverse segments on the end of the kneading section, because we were thinking that's where the reaction takes place. Let's get the material kneaded up lots. Um, and we were going for, let's go for the harshest conditions we could think of. So it was really just intuition, but I think there is opportunities a lot for machine learning in this case. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what makes a reaction more amenable to twin, twin screw extrusion versus ball milling? The requirement, the temperature. Um, it's so much, it's nice because you get so many reactions to go a bit faster in the extruder because you can apply that temperature gradient. Um, so sometimes we don't even screen our reactions anymore via ball milling um, because we know we have that extra element of temperature. So if, if they are improved by temperature, then we would go via, that would make them more amenable by twin screw extrusion. So for example, uh, the perylene dice, uh, those reactions didn't go very well in the, in the ball mill. Um, in fact, we would literally get about 10% conversion at most whereas we were able to get them to go quite fast in the extruder. All right, let's, um, let's wrap up with a general one. Uh, the question is, oh, no, excuse me, here we go. Uh, what do you think is the limit of scale up for twin screw, twin screw extruders? Okay, um, well, twin screw extruders are currently used to process materials on ton levels. So you can process uh, several tons per day um, in large industries, for example, foods and polymers. In terms of chemical synthesis, I don't think the scale up is going to be that straightforward. And I don't think that we, we might get like tons per hour um, in twin screw extrusion um, by scaling it up. At the minute, we've got kilograms per hour, but I do think we can get up to maybe a couple of hundred kilograms. But then obviously the, you need experts coming in in terms of the safety aspects, whether it's ACE tech protected and things like that. So I do think there might be some limitations in the future, but I do think there is the possibility maybe to get around them. All right, excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Crawford, for your presentation. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you again, Dr. Crawford, for an outstanding presentation and thank you for joining us. Reminder that there have been quite a few excellent speakers as part of the seminar series, and we encourage you to check them out on YouTube. And we look forward to you also joining us for future presentations through 21 and into 2022. We look forward to having you join us for all of the mechanochemistry discussions. Thank you again.